integration of quality and risk management with the American Society for Quality. Uh, Desmond Mahadeo is going to be uh, presenting today. Uh, Michelle Gannett will be our moderator. And uh, enjoy. Take it away, Desmond. Okay. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending today's uh, regional webinar. So uh, before I start here, I just want to quickly um, make sure that you're all getting, uh, you know, good a good video stream as well as uh, audio. If you're not, please um, please uh, type in the chat room so that Michelle can uh, uh, interrupt me and uh, you know let me know if everything is going fine. The second thing I want to talk to you about is I've been presenting uh, risk and quality management over the last year. And um, some of you who may have attended any of my previous webinars would see some of the familiar slides because I did this at the GYRS last year with different flair, the SAE, SESQ Toronto section and some of the monthly meetings as well. So bear with me if you've seen the slides before. Um, it's certainly, um, I'm not regurgitating it, but the theme is the same pretty much. It's the integration of risk management and quality. Sources of the PowerPoint are taken from uh, different uh, areas on the uh, on the uh, World Wide Web and other uh, reference sources and published documents. And where I've taken where I've taken these from, I have uh, acknowledged those in each one of the slides. So now let's dive right into the presentation. So here's a little bit about me. Um, I don't want to go into very uh, lengthy details here. Um, uh, my name is Desmond Mahadio. I'm a management consultant. And um, I'm just completing a, just completed a consultant contract as manager of project management for Plateau North America, which is an enterprise software company that provides risk management software for the industry, for both for the medical devices as well as the automotive industry. So it is because of this, over the last year, I've been absorbed in a lot of the automotive focus of risk management and other areas as well. I've got more than two decades of experience uh, across very uh, different sectors, as you can see on the slide. Um, I, I am a qualified mechanical engineer, Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, CQE, as well as a QMS auditor. Over the years as a business management professional, with a very strong passion for quality, I've always uh, contributed to the industry across a wide spectrum, leveraging all my core skills in project management, continuous improvement, and quality. I volunteer, um, I do believe in giving back, so I volunteer my, my, my uh, service to the standards development in ISO at both the national and international level, uh, working with over 45 to 65 member countries representing Canada through the Standards Council of Canada. We've just completed the Innovation Management Standard, the IMS, which was published last year. And currently, I'm heading up the Strategic Intelligence Management. I've uh, been involved in a lot of speaking engagements, both locally as well as in the USA. Now, I, what I would like to leave with you here, because this is the American Society of Quality, and also, um, I've been volunteering from since 1987 um, and held many different chair positions with the society. Um, currently, I'm the chair for 2021 for the ESP Toronto section, the largest, second largest section in the world. And so I encourage all of you to volunteer for if you're members of the ESQ so that you can uh, be part of something bigger than yourself, share your knowledge and give back and contribute to the growth of the quality community and the business community at large. So today, here is what I want to look at in terms of the presentation outline. I just wanted to set the stage, I mean, talk a little bit about Industry 4 on design and manufacturing and the challenges that are being faced to ensure safety. So we'll look at current state, um, what is needed to address this, and how we can enable Quality 4 to connect safety and risk management. Um, I will explore, you know, the entire dynamics of looking at people, processes and technology, that integration, how that works, and why it's necessary. And look at technology in general. What do we need? What do we need as, a, as, as, a, as, as, a, as a individuals within companies and organizations so that we can limit those warranty costs and liability as well as protect our customers? What I will do is look at a specific example from the automotive sector to show what is being done as a response and what we see in industry, regardless of which sector it is, the response is always to introduce new regulations and stringent guidelines so that they can have 
um, better safety. But because safety is integrated with quality management, we need to look at it in a very holistic way. So I will, I'm just going to use an example out of the ISO 26262, which is uh, from the automotive sector, as well as the FMEA LSR. So I, I just want to add some context, because I know many of you are from a different wide cross-section of industry here. Um, and I want to look at it from a conceptual standpoint, because the core principles of processes, regulations, guidelines, they're basically the same. And the whole thrust is prevention. And you want to make sure that the product or the service, whichever one you're doing, you've got the safety, quality, and reliability to that end user. So as you see in my diagram here, I have sort of put it in a very spatial manner. You've got quality management systems or MMS as well, management system standards. And those are your 9001, which is across both the manufacturing and the service industry. You've got your AS9100 for aerospace, 17025 for lab, 13485 for medical devices, GMP, ASIP. IATF 16949, Innovation Management Systems. Then you've got your spew of regulatory standards, uh, quality, FDA, IHI, IEC, 6108, etc. So those are all your those are all your regulations. Then we look at the EMS or environmental management systems or environmental management standards, such, such as the 14001. And these standards govern anything to do with environmental. You've got your social responsibility, like 26,000, 5,001 for energy. And on top of all of this, you have some specific regulatory and governmental um, uh, requirements that you have to meet. Then you look at safety, safety for OHAS or occupational health and safety. You've got your functional safety for ISO 26262, SOTIF, which is for electronics in, in automobile, and again, in this area, you also, for those of you who have been working in the industry on joint health and safety committees, you know that you have to be able to be uh, knowledgeable of the act and the regulations as it relates to health and safety in Canada. Then you, you have risk management. Risk management is a complete management system standard. It talks about, it talks about how to manage risk on a, on a very high level within your company. And I will, I will kind of touch on this standard in this presentation, ISO 31000. You've got your business continuity, the 222301, and also for medical devices, you've got a 14971. Information standards are next. You've got your 27001, which are IT, and right now they're looking at the cybersecurity, which is on the development. For those of you who are interested, contact the Sanders Association, it's SEC. Get involved if, you, if you've got a passion for cybersecurity and you want to contribute. Go right ahead. I don't know what stage they are. And then, of course, on top of all of these, you've got your CSR or customer specific requirements, such as the AIAG, is the automotive sector, the VDA for Europe, you have food and drug, pharmaceutical, and then customer manufacturing standards. So depending whether you're going to Sanofi or you're going to GM or Ford, whoever you're going to, they have got specific areas. So that's a world of standards out there, processes, guidelines, regulations. And these are rapidly evolving and changing as a response for consumer safety and it is also integrated into quality so this is this is what i want to make sure that you know we're all on the same playing feel here where we understand that you know fundamentally everything is from a core conceptual standpoint the same so the underlying approach i'll be discussing is relevant to any one of these industries that you're in so i'm not i'm not um uh, you know minimizing um, you know, uh, somebody in medical with GMP and saying, well, if you know one standard, you know all of that. But this, from a high level, what it talks about is these things become understanding. In, in standards today, management system standards, we use what is known as the Annex L. And so you, any standard that you pick up, you will see 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And those are all similar so that those, those standards could be locked in what's known as a harmonious, harmonious approach or or an IHS harmonized standards. So if your company has got four or five standards, you can have basically one of them. So the other thing I want to, sorry, the other thing I want to talk about is, since we're gonna, you know, we're gonna discuss um, risk and quality. ISO 31000 defines risk in the new 2018 version. It says risk is an effect 
of uncertainty on objectives. That is the definition. It's the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And an effect is either a positive or a negative deviation from what is expected. Today, we operate in an uncertain world. There's always a chance that things will not go according to plan. So every step, every process, or every step within those processes has an element of risk, and therefore every outcome is uncertain. Whenever you try to achieve an objective, we don't always get the results we expect. So we can either get a positive result, or sometimes we get a negative result. And occasionally, we may get both. The next concept I want to introduce, and this is because um, from the strategic intelligence management, we talk about something called VUCA. And it has become more and more to the forefront. It was developed many years ago in the military uh, when they look at strategic planning. And what VUCA stands for, this acronym is Volatility, Uncertainty, Complexity, and Ambiguity. Today, we live in a world of VUCA that is characterized by VUCA. Um, for example, what is volatility? Volatility is the rate of change. The rate of change, the dynamic challenges that you get. Now, you can, it's not very difficult to understand this. However, there's very limited knowledge, knowledge that is available. So, for example, and I don't want to jump on this bandwagon. I mean, let's look at COVID-19. I mean, the volatility, things are changing. The only thing you can do when you've got volatility is preparedness. Preparedness, redundancies, buffer. So you can buffer. You can buffer inventory. You can buffer things. You can limit spending because you're there prepared for those volatility. Uncertainty. Uncertainty, you sort of understand that there's a cause and effect relationship that happens. It's known. However, you also realize that there is no guarantee that you can really predict what's going to happen. So there's an uncertainty about it. So if you have this sort of things, you start to look at information, what is available information, you create a system structure within the organization so that you can sort of help to predict the, the, or, or, or reduce that un uncertainty rather. Then complexity. In complexity, we talk about many interconnected parts. It's hard to arrive at a very simple or a simplistic solution. There are so many factors, there are so many interrelationships and so many working parts that the only way to counter this is that you need specialization for understanding. You need specialization, you need training, you need to make sure that you understand, you look at it from a system standpoint so that you can reduce and understand some of those complexity. And the last one is ambiguity. Ambiguity talks about clarity. When something lacks clarity, so it's sort of different from uncertainty. Now it's not clear. You don't know. You have all these cause and effect relationships that you understand. You understand the rate of change and everything else. You understand uncertainty. But the only way for you to really get clarity is to do tests. You can do testing. You can do experimentation. And that's how you can test the markets. You can do strategic intelligence management. And that's how you can get past this. Why did I introduce the VUCA concept? I introduced the VUCA concept because risk, that's where when we talk about risk, we have to look at it from that perspective, the environment in which we live in today. And of course, quality. From the ISO 9001 definition, quality is defined as the totality of features and characteristics of a product or service that bear on its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs. So when we look at this in terms of risk and quality, risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives, and when quality is in fact, could be said as the objective. So that's the relationship between risk and quality. You want to make sure that the effect of uncertainty that you can be able to achieve your objective. Now, we look at SISO 31000 and it talks about the systems level and the process level. So the ISO 31000 2018, it has three main, uh, three main sections. So it starts by listing a set of risk management principles. And you use these principles to guide the establishment of your risk management framework. Then you use that framework to guide you to develop your risk management process. And together, these three sections combine to make up your risk management program. So this is, this, is, this is the way we look at it. As you can see, the principles will influence that design and implementation. The framework is more at a, a strategic level. It's what uh, the leadership would have to be involved with. And processes are done 
to the actual tools. What are some of these principles? I'm not going to go into all the principles. You can Google this. You can find good literature on it. But what it talks about is really making sure that it's tailored to meet your organization. It's dynamic. It's iterative and responsive to change. And you can see some of the terms here from these principles is based on the VUCA concept. And of course, you've got to be able to facilitate some continued improvement to the organization. The framework is all your policy objectives, the mandates, the commitment to plans, the relationships, the accountabilities, your resources. How are you planning for those processes, those activities that you use to manage the organization risk as a whole? And of course, the processes would now be the application of those management policies, the processes, the set of acti activities that you want to do, and uh, you know, establishing, as you see here, this is a breakdown of risk, establishing your context, your context, what is the context of this risk? You identify the risk, you analyze the risk, you evaluate the risk, and then you treat the risk. One of the things I'd like to talk about here is, and then of course you, you monitor and review and you communicate it throughout the organization through reporting and, and review risk. One of the things I want to talk about here is simply um, risk treatment. Risk treatment means that after analysis and evaluation, there are always two things. And some people believe that, well, you got a risk. How do you treat the risk? You always have to mitigate the risk. No, you don't. There are, two, two, there are many ways of doing uh, risk treatment, but two of the, 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 the ways you can, you can actually decide as a corporation to accept that risk based on whether it meets the regulations or not. One of my favorite topics is talking about quality. As we talk about quality, we talk about cost of quality. Now, what is the cost of quality? The total cost of quality is made up the cost of poor quality and the cost of good quality. What are the costs of poor quality? We know the cost of poor quality is all your internal failure costs, all the scrap rework that you do, your lack of making the uh, OEE, your productivity rates. Those are your internal failure costs. Your external failure costs is when you get complaints, warranty costs, recovery costs, all those complaints from the customer. Those are external costs and those are all poor cost of poor quality which we term as reactive and sometimes we have no choice but to address them we have to address those costs so you've got your internal and external for your costs and you have to address them on the other hand you've got your cost of good quality cost of good quality is your appraisal costs and including QMS audit that I'm not going to debate that some people say it's a prevention but in fact it's a detection you're checking your system to see if it works all the inspection, inspection, inspection from receiving right down to final inspection, those are your appraisal costs. And then you've got your prevention costs. And prevention costs is risk mitigation. Prevention costs is proper design. And some of the tools you can use there is like FMEA or ASAP, which is daily mode effect analysis or hazard analysis critical control points. So you are actually looking at the risk up front as a prevention method. What I've seen over the years, and um, uh, you know, as a quality practitioner, companies are very reluctant in invest investing in prevention costs and if you invest in prevention costs then what would happen it would impact those external and internal failure costs and your cost of poor quality so this is moving from a firefighting mode into the prevention code we talk a lot about quality four i just want to briefly talk about quality uh, quality four as we talk about industry four now here is a here is a timeline of industry four from the 1780s all the way to today it started out with the advent of the steam engine and the uh, cotton gin and everything else out in the 1784, mechanization, water power, steam power. And then we moved into mass production by the 1870s into the early 1900s with mass production and the introduction of Ford assembly line. By 1969, we got into computers and automation. And today, we have fast forward to what is an era of di digital and cyber, cyber uh, functions, IOTs, and there is a blurring of lines between physical and digital. The speed of this, the speed of the and impact of this in the fourth era, it in fact has no historical pre precedent. And industry four is a new reality that we're living. So we need to we need to consider quality, we need to consider risk, and how does it work in industry four? And that's the that's the focus of what I want to talk about. Safety to end users. If you go to this, if you go to the Canadian website, you will see for all the alerts. Uh, it's not in any one specific industry. There's for consumer goods, vehicles, food, health products. Complexity is driving harder challenge in design, manufacturing, distribution, storage, radical devices. Why? Recently, there was a recall and incident pump. Um, uh, you know, an incident pump for somebody cost about 7,500 Canadian. And 
that particular pump had was giving an incorrect dosing. So again, there's a complexity of the, of, of the technology that we have today, and those are those are things that cause fatality. Accelerated evolution. We see innovation, new ideas pushing companies so that they can be at the cutting edge, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles. Now, what took months, the idea is this is an accelerated evolution. What took months and years to develop, and it's now being done in weeks and days. So this is the impact on quality, safety, and we need to manage the risk within the degree of complexity that we see today. Here is a slide that I took from Regal Masters. As you can see in the top left-hand corner, we had over 17.8 million vehicles being recalled in 2018 for software issues, and that is because of complexity, and that is of the 47 million. Of those 47 million, 30% was actually mandatory recalls. And the impact is not only in the, on the original owner, it's also on the people who are going to buy the used vehicles when the recalls were not done. This is a new era. We talk about MBR or miles between recalls. You know, the numbers are scary. We're looking at these numbers, 11.8 billion in claims, 10.3 for warranty recalls, and 22.1 billion. And we're seeing that the increase is, is year over year is getting more, 26% increase over 2015. I don't have data for the subsequent years, um, or I was unable to get it. But this, this just shows you that if you were to plot a trend line, you'll see that it becomes more and more. What is happening, the cost, of this is being passed on to consumers because manufacturers are not going to bear the cost. They're going to pass it on to consumers. So we see a steady rise in the vehicles because of the complexity. One of the other things is that we see an early adoption of technology. When, when uh, for example, you've got a lane keep assist and you've got blind spot assist and front collision warning and uh, cruise control, active active cruise control, eventually you become a uh, you adopt to those technology, you sit back in the car, you relax, and then suddenly one of those systems fail and it could be fatal. So that's the, that's the challenge we have today. So the response of industry has been to give more regulations, standards, and guidelines in an effort to control it. And on top of that, they start to they do uh, what we call differentiation, market differentiation. So Ford wants to differentiate from GM, GM wants to differentiate from Chrysler, and many other industries, you will see the same sort of differentiation. So on their suppliers, they have imposed their own customer-specific requirements on top of that. Now, these are only part of the big picture. I mean, you, you, you know, in design for engineering, design for uh, reliability, those are other considerations such as, uh, you know, uh, testing and simulation. So I'm not saying that just, just, just these are the things that are driving this as well. I just want to look, as I said, briefly into ISO 26262, which is, which is a standard that is used for safety. As you can see, it takes it from concept phase all the way to production and decommissioning. What is important to note here is the big V and the little W, which is in five and six. And this shows the integration of the entire cycle. The 26262 is, in fact, uh, primarily for mechatronics, any electronic or electrical device that triggers a mechanical movement. That is, that is considered a mechatronic. And this came out of the IEC 6108, which was for nuclear device. So there's a lot of the, a lot of the standards that come out for safety were derived from that as well. What is important to note here is the little stage. Since it's a full life cycle, the benefits, you need to analyze your risk early in the development phase. You need to establish your safety requirements and you need to test and validate so that you can make a good product. So this is how, in looking at your entire quality and risk management, you need to do this thing really upfront and very early in your, in your, in your um, application. This is what the standard looks like. Um, there's a scope, as I said, it's for mechatronics. What I want to point out here is systems must design with appropriate level of rigor. So they introduce a new word called rigor. And what rigor is, is really intrinsic quality on one side and safety on the other side. However, as we know, sorry. However, as we know, if, if something is designed with a high intrinsic quality, then it's more likely to perform safely. So when you decompose this, so this is where the relationship between quality and safety comes in. If you do it early up in the design, you will meet that rigor that is expected. So they decompose it into what's known as severity, exposure, and controllability. And severity um, is the potential harm in use by the driver and the passengers. 
the exposure, the amount of uh, exposure you have. So you look at it, for example, you drive 100,000 kilometers and you're looking at the power window that would fail. How often do you roll it up and down? And the controllability. And these are then broken down into ASILs, um, which is the automotive uh, safety integrity levels. Now, one of the other things we talk about was the FMEA MSR. It's a new guideline. Now, and like I was talking about the lane keep assist. Here, you have an auto eight system. It has dual cameras so that is looking at the lane markings in the road. The car drifts out. The monitoring system response brings it back into place. So what is needed? What is needed for the integration of quality risk management and safety? You need the people, processes, and technology. And this, this triangle integrated with quality risk management is a success story. Now, people, process, and technology came out of the what we know as quality four as an approach. And if you integrate that, you'll be able to have a system that could improve that cost of poor quality. So this is looking at people, processes, and technology. Processes would be all your guidelines, regulations, etc. But how do you enable people to work in this era of VUCA and complexity? So collaboration, we need technology that enables collaboration. We need platforms, we need databases, we need, we need to, to move from the old era of spreadsheets and whiteboards and manual, manual working together. We need real-time data. We need to understand how to do knowledge management and recycle failures in real time back into your system. So the technology has to keep up, your data management has to keep up as well. So quality four. What is quality four? Quality four is, is, is a direct result of industry four. It is in fact a digitalization of quality using technology as the enabler to drive the management of systems and compliance to deliver results. So that is basically what it is. It's not saying that we're gonna get rid of people. It's saying that you're gonna use technology as the enabler to drive systems and compliances. So it focuses on improvements in culture, collaboration, competency, leadership, and these all are made possible by the use of technology. And some of the benefits, you have real-time process monitoring, data collection, and data analytics. The next few slides are taken from a recent study in 2019, of August of 2019, by the BCG or the Boston Consulting Group, in partnership with the American Society for Quality and the DGQ, which is the, the uh, Deutsche or German uh, Quality Association. And they wanted to understand what is technology's role. And a lot of this is available at the ESQ.org site as well as on the internet. You can find a study. And what the study found that quality four is more than just about technology. It is a way of managing that quality in which digital tools can enhance your organization's ability to consistently give customers high-performing products. The study demonstrated that there is no, no way that it diminishes people in assuring quality. It actually gave people the skills to apply digital tools to tell the data-driven stories, to be more factual about what they're doing. And going forward, this would be an essential part of ensuring quality in the factor of the future. They even went on to state and quote directly from it that the factories or the companies that will be winning in the 2020s and beyond will be those that use digital to redefine themselves. Now, to implement quality four, companies need a structured approach that involves prioritizing to resolve your critical pain points, aligning with your vision, and closing with your skill gaps. And you also need to manage it better across the enterprises, the entire enterprise, the entire organization, so that you can create a culture in which all employees take ownership of quality. Now, I know there's a lot of quality practitioners here, and this last statement, employees take ownership of quality, we've been trying to do that for the last 40 years. And there's always the, the story, um, who's responsible for quality? Everybody. And who's accountable for quality? But I'll just leave that as a rhetorical question. But we all have been there, you know, and it's always the question. And somebody would point to, yes, the quality manager. But this is what, again, the whole idea of quality for industry for how do we work in it, is to use those to enable. This slide is talking about the, uh, the state of affairs. So far, only 16% of companies, and this, story, this was as of 2019, and I don't think much has happened then, have started to actually implement the quality for within their organization using technology to enable. 
twenty percent has started some some kind of information, but what I like to look at is the sixty three percent has not even reached the planning stage. So sixty three percent of the companies have not been doing anything. So quality four is throughout your entire organization process. So if you look at R and D, procurement, manufacturing, logistics, service, and after sales, all the way down to uh, cross functional. Uh, areas, what I want to focus on is at the top right-hand corner, and this slide is taken again from that study, is the centralization of quality data, end-to-end -end quality management system, quality costs, and transparency. This is where, if you look at the quality data that you're going to be getting, that is where you need to have the use of the technology that can enable facts. You need real-time data, data that is relevant, data that is timely so that you can make that decision to be able to reduce that cost of quality. We need to embrace this. We need to embrace the technology both within the organization in terms of what we're doing, whether we're doing 3D barcode scanning or what it is we're doing, as well as methods of data collection. So quality four has many applications throughout the value chain. I would say the greatest impact as I showed you in the 26262 example, is in a research and development design and manufacturing way up front. We need to integrate safety and quality risk management. We talk about rigor. We talk about how, how um, quality and safety are related. We need to have real-time data with users in some sort of collaborative platform to focus on preventive measures. We need technology to enable risk management uh, uh, methodologies such as FMEAs, ASAP, uh, other methodologies that incorporate safety to provide efficiency and effectiveness in doing these analysis. Efficiency meaning that you can do it, uh, you know, the, the rate at which you need to be doing this. You don't take a, a year to do it. I mean, you, you do it in real time, you do it faster, and at the same time become effective. And you need to do this to prevent those recalls, improve your cost of proof quality, and drive continual improvement. I would leave you with this. Data analytics has indeed become paramount. The timeliness, the integrity, and the relevance of data is critical to the survival of the industry. We need to drive the cost of poor quality down. We need to limit the warranty. We need to make sure that consumers are prevented from the, from the dangers of safety and fatality. We need, to, we need to make sure that it's timely. We need to understand how to churn big data and take out relevant data and so that we can be faster in having a factual approach to decision making. Across manufacturing industries, as the survey showed, companies that win in 2020s will be those that use digital to redefine the meaning of quality excellence. And so it's not, you know, sometimes it's not easy. Watch for it. <laughs> so it's it's not easy. It's not easy to um. It's not easy to have congruence. It's a difficult challenge because we change management is oftentimes difficult. And so with that, I knew I sped through some things very quickly. What I was focusing on is the uh, underlying message that regardless of which industry you're in, which which whichever processes or regulations or guidelines that you're following you do need to understand that there has to be an integration of people, processes, and technology. In this world of quality four, it does not mean that you're going to be replaced by technology. You're going to take those processes which are being stepped up, which are being becoming more stringent, and we're seeing new ones coming up every day. But you're going to use those processes, and you're going to have people working in those processes. But in order for them to work in those processes, you need to enable it. Technology becomes the enabler. And so with that, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, my number is up there. I'll probably leave it up there. Um, the link for the YouTube channel, uh, Michelle could probably put it in the uh, he could put it in the um, the chat box. If not, we'll come with the uh, presentation. So I'll just like at this point hand it back to uh, hand it back over to Ruth and Michelle. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Well, thank you, Desmond. That was. Uh... Very clear, very nice, and uh, I'm sure everyone uh, will take something from it.
Uh, so what uh, we would like to do is uh, invite some questions. Uh, Michelle, take it away. Yeah, sorry about that. I was just taking time trying to type the uh, YouTube channel correctly, and now it's been shared with everybody uh, in chat. If you can, copy and paste that into uh, a file on your own uh, device, and you'll be able to follow it to, uh, to YouTube after. Uh, two questions did come in early on in the presentation. So uh, the first one was, and I just have to find it now because it was in chat, not in QA. Um, is it possible uh, to have a summary sheet covering all of these applied standards guidelines to each section just as a reference? Yes, I can certainly provide that, but there is an excellent article in the quality progress of uh, May or June, I think, if you, are, if you are subscribing to that. I think it's at the back of it. It's a, it's a very nice article, but sure, I, I have no problem in, uh, in, in you know, putting that up um, and providing it. So uh, all of this will be recorded. We will send, definitely send a, rec uh, a recording to you. Uh, we can include some uh, extra notes if, yeah. if you wish. And that probably answers the second question that we received, which was, is, this present is the presentation material going to be shared with participants after the session? And I had already replied that it is being recorded. Um, however, uh, are you, you apply, um, are you supplying a, a PDF or anything uh, to accompany that, uh, Desmond? Um, no, because really, as you can see, uh, there's not the slides or the slides are not very um, wordy. Uh, most of the most of the content is in uh, what I've been pretty much talking about. I mean, there's some there's some slides on risk management, and you know, you can get the thing is. Um, all this information with some amount of um, uh, research, uh, you can you can certainly uh, find it out there. But if they want a PDF of it, sure. But more, if you look back at the slides, you will see that most of them are just graphics. Uh, so just to, just to let everyone know, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the recordings, uh, the recording provides both uh, the audio and the video so that when you listen to the recording you will be able to follow along with that with the slides so that that shouldn't be a problem okay all right we got a couple more questions came in through chat uh so far nothing through q a uh can you uh, expand about fmea sure so fmea is failure mode effect analysis and um if you go to my channel i've got about three or four different videos on it and, and, and different eiag and some actual content but to give you a high level, what you look at is in design, whether it's reverse engineering, whether it's, uh, whether it's a new product, you look at the structure. What is the structure of the system? So when you talk about, when you talk about the failure mode, you're looking at the structure. So let's say, for example, you're looking at a pen, a pen, a ballpoint pen. So the structure is the outer case, the inner refill, and then maybe a cap. So those are three components. So that's your system. Now those system is integrated. Now you look at the function of the pen. What is the function of the pen? The function of the pen maybe is to write, is to do, it's just it's, it's make, make sure it doesn't leak, whatever. And then from those functions, you're gonna have a failures in those functions. So structure, function, failures. When you have the failures, now you assess the severity of the failure. What is gonna happen if the pen leaks in someone's pocket? What is the severity of that? And then you look at, after you look at the severity, you look at the occurrence. What is the probability of occurrence? You can know, get this from known design uh, in the past. You can get this from catalogs. You can get this from actual validation and testing. So you've got your prevention methods, which means true selection of the, the pen nib so that it doesn't leak, or the cap so that it doesn't leak. Um, and then you look at the detection method. There is also considerations for regulations. For example, many of you may not know that all ballpoint pens must have a hole in the cap. And the reason for that is if a child swallows a cap, which is a high occurrence, believe it or not, then they would not, they would not suffocate, but they would actually be able to breathe because the hole would allow breathing in their system. 
So that's, that's uh, I mean, I, I didn't think about it, but now that we talk about the pen and the cap, yeah. So I, hopefully that answers your question. If you want to know more about FMEA, certainly go to the channel. I've got quite a few videos up there talking about AIAG and the, the, the uh, VDA over in Europe and how we handle it. And I've also got more details on uh, uh, monitor, monitoring system responses as well. All right, we've got another one here. Uh, what would be the indicator indicators and criteria to evaluate maturity level of organization towards quality 4.0? So the Boston, the Boston uh, study, if you read the Boston study, and I mean, you know, you can go into it, they make, they make uh, suggestions. What, what they were looking at, they were looking at the adoption rate, you know, the adoption rate of, of many organizations and say, well, are we really thinking about it? Um, at, what rate, at what stage are we at? Do we have, are we investing in, for example, some companies are still using spreadsheets to do CPK. Did we take the chance and go for Minitab or did we, I'm not trying to sell Minitab by the way or, or Heinz FMEA or any one of those programs, but I'm just saying, what you're looking at, it is, it is the degree of complexity that we have today. You want to be efficient. And what is efficiency? Efficiency, when we look at processes, there's input, process, and output. When you talk about efficiencies, efficiencies is a rate at which you convert those inputs within the process. So if you're going to use spreadsheets and you're going to copy and paste, and you're going to insert lines and merge cells, you're wasting a lot of time. Whereas if you've got dedicated software, which is in, in databases, and that can work and can and, and allow collaboration, you're already becoming efficient. The second part of it is effectiveness. When you move across the process, when you meet the desired intent from the input to the output, that is termed effectiveness. So theoretically, you could be 100% efficient, but 0% effective, theoretically, but that's not never the case because it's all interrelated. So effectiveness, when you take off all those administrative functions away from yourself, you're now focused on becoming effective. You're focused on doing proper risk, not risk analysis. You're not just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. You're actually doing something. You're actually getting and capturing field failures. You're actually getting real-time data back into your system. So that, that, is, that is some of the, 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 the maturity levels that you're going to be at. I mean, imagine uh, autonomous vehicles, imagine artificial intelligence. I mean, it's all over. I talk about the, um, the, the insulin pumps. We talk about medical devices, what is happening in the, in the hospital. What are the severity? We do FMEAs for those in, on, one, on the 13485. What would happen if, uh, if um, the IV dispenser goes wrong? What is the severity? What is the redundancy within that system? So that's, that's how you have to think about it. So we need to start moving up to the next level because the complexity is here. All right, we've got another one. What are the main differences in the risk management for service industries? So for service industries, um, I have worked, I've worked in, um, I've worked in, um, in distribution. I've worked in service, service industry as well. Um, I was once a regional quality manager for Garda um, on, a, on a contract basis in the airport. So that's a service. We provide customer service. So you are within the ambits of the regulations. So that is what drives your risk. So that's how, that's how you have to look at it. For example, we were doing pre-board screening. You know, you go through the airport and then you have to be screened. You go through handheld med 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 detectors, physical search of a bag, physical search of a person, and you're looking for, you know, hidden objects and, and uh, potential things that can bring the aircraft down. And that's what, you know, when you go through the airport. Now, you're governed by those, and your system now, your system risk is governed by those. So when you look at risk, you have to always go back to that model that I showed you. You have to look at context. You have to look at the identification of the risk. And where does the identification of the risk come? It comes from the context in which you operate. So the, the, the context in which you operate for that service industry, those are your risks. What is the risk, I mean, of uh, if you promise on-time delivery or uh, even a pizza pizza or whatever, and you said 20 minutes and, and, and you never could deliver the pizza, what is the risk? How does it impact? So that's your context of your risk. It doesn't always have to be safety. So you, you look at the context, you identify the risk, you analyze the risk, you look at, look at the risk in terms of the probability of the risk occurring, uh, the, the probability, the severity, and then you evaluate it, meaning that what am I going to do? What, what can I do? What do I have in place? Evaluation means what do I have in place? Do I have trained drivers? What do I have? And then 
you decide in risk control, do I mitigate this risk or do I accept this risk? What is the impact on my organization? So this is what I'm trying to look at. Um, right now, for example, I mean, I'm talking to a lot, um, to a lot of uh, potential, uh, uh, you know, employers and, and um, they're advertising and they say, well, we need somebody who knows especially about ASAP or they know about this or they know about that. But I'm taking it up to the next level. I'm saying, look, we're talking about systems thinking. We're talking about organization. You need to structure your thought at that high level. Once you structure your thought at a high level, then you can go. I mean, if you want to know about the CFIR regulations or food and drug regulations, it's available online. You can get those regulations, but you need to understand the context in which you are going to operate, how to do it. So I'm not recommending that everyone should be a generalist, but what I'm saying is that you need to bring systems thinking and you need to understand that across all industries, it's pretty much the same. Whether it's automotive, uh, whether it's uh, food and drug, but it's um, the medical devices, whatever area you work in, there are always risks. All right. Uh, could you please explain a little about, uh, sorry, let me try that again. Could you ex please explain a little bit about VUCA? So <laughs> VUCA, um, I was first introduced to this terminology when I was working uh, on the standard of strategic intelligence management. It's a great opportunity. Um, I, you know, as a quality practitioner, quality improvement practitioner, uh, business business consultants as well, working with working with the whole concept of VUCA because it came out of a military strategy. So volatility, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of other good reference material out there. I mean, uh, the methodology of how you use it, there they put it in a grid and you look at um, what it is you can do, and there's there's all kinds of um, tools. But what I just wanted to introduce, I am not an expert in the area, but I use it. I use it to understand. You use it to understand where it's coming from. So we talk about volatility, right? The dynamic, the ways in which things change. Um, you know, I could. Uh, I don't want to go back to the slide, but anyway. So the volatility. You know, things change rapidly. In our old, why is it important to consider in the old way of thinking? We look at risk management, and in the old, I can't remember the old definition. But uncertainty of achieving your objectives is perhaps the best definition of, of risk, and it could be an opportunity. So when you look at volatility, things you have to consider that the environment that I'm working in is a highly dynamic environment. What was relevant yesterday is no longer relevant today. So things are changing rapidly. And how do I, as a company, buffer myself to offset this? And the only way you can is... A good example is inventory, have the buffer, have the things, depending on the context of your organization where you're working, you have to understand. I will, I understand, I want to have a basic understanding. For example, we talk about COVID-19. We know that you need PPE. So obviously, if you're a company that's running out and things are changing rapidly, and we see things are changing rapidly overnight, for example, I'm just, I don't want to use this as an example, but I'm just using this. Um, for example, we saw early on, they talk about transmission that well, mass may not be important, this may not be important, but we had limited knowledge. We didn't know what was happening. So if as a company, you know one thing, you know that the N95 masks were the ones that are going to protect and you are in the healthcare industry, then you make sure you stock up on those because you don't know what is going to change. It's going to get better. It's not going to get better, but you would be in a position to be able to function. And, and I mean, I don't want to comment. the way things went but basically those are the those are the essential things you have to think about you have to think about how do i buffer it what do i need if i'm going to open up back so that's volatility uncertainty you kind of know about the cause and effect but then again you don't know what really is going to happen so with the uncertainty if you cannot predict if you can't predict with any certainty then you have to start investing in information gathering in more systems and more structure within your organization and this is one of the things that we talk about strategic intelligence, right? We look at strategic intelligence, what is happening around the world, how things are happening, and how you're positioning your, your, your organization, what's the context of your organization, what, 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 uh, what kind of environment you're operating in. So that's your uncertainty. Um, complexities, I mean, that's, that's a given. If it's the simplest process, the simplest process, like I, even I explained the, the pen and cap, the ballpoint pen and cap, very simple process that requires just three items in a structure. 
when you take it apart and you start to look at the interrelationship of each part on the other and you look at the design of that ballpoint pen and you look at the thing it becomes very complex i could produce a 10 line or 50 line fmea design fmea and if i go into manufacture a 20 line pfmea on it so that i can be efficient and effective in producing that thing and make uh, drive profitability so everything is complex so there's a complexity how do you decide on your complexity and again ambiguity we may know we may know if we do certain things certain things are going to happen and this is different from uncertainty there's no clarity now there's no clarity and only strong experimentation like again you have to do all the tests you have to do all the trials you have to do all these things then you can it's validation so only validation can help you to clear ambiguity so hopefully i mean you can go explore this for there's a lot of tools that are used in vuca but um that's where i want to leave it i'm not an expert in that area i've never i've never um done the vuca directly i've used the vuca concept i've used vuca as a way of understanding the nature of the business understanding the context of the organization and then when we develop the strategic intelligence management standard we use that as a springboard and then we use another technique and the technique for strategic intelligence that we use was using data gathering information knowledge and wisdom and then in that in that paradigm we use that as intelligence being the product of everything else and then intelligence is, is, is tailored to strategic level or to leadership level hopefully i answered your question so i think we have one i want time for one more question and uh, then we'd like to uh ask you guys to uh answer a poll and of course then after that i'll have some kind of public service announcement so uh, one more <laughs> yep and i think that's the only one we oh the second one showed up but i think i'm going to go with the other one. Oh no it's not a question it was a, a thank you thank you very much uh q a person last question can we use 31,000 as part of risk management in ISO 9001 implementation? So to answer that question, yes, certainly. Um, I you, you have to understand, first of all, 31,000 is not uh, a standard that you register to, okay? It's a guideline standard. So the 31,000, you don't register to 31,000. So that's the first thing. But it guides you into risk management and certainly when you get to risk, when you get to risk, you can use that. You can use that to put to put your framework and everything else in in the company. You can use that as a guideline to put it in. Yes, but it's not. Uh, it's not. Um, it's not a registration type standard. All right. Uh, thank you, Desmond. Uh, you're uh, welcome. So. Uh... I'm really good at ad lib. I'm finding it. So, uh, Michelle, can you open up the poll? Yeah. I was, before I was going to do that, um, at the top of your screens, you should see a blue area that says "Viewing Desmond Mahadeo's uh, Desktop." If you hover your mouse over top of that, you may see a uh, panel for Q and A. If not, go to the arrow to the side, and you should see panels. The uh, sorry, not Q and A. Sorry, I meant polling. Polling. As soon as I activate it, if it doesn't show up on your screens immediately, go up through there, find it, and then you'll be able to select polling. It looks like a set of graphs. Okay, so give me one second to select the poll. And it appears that I'll have to do this in a unsh... Oh, uh, yeah, I'll have to control from you, uh, Desmond, I believe. So um, bear with me one moment. That's fine. We got about a five minutes, I guess. And so while we're waiting for Michelle to get things going, just to let you know that the next uh, regional webinar will be on July the 28th. It's, it'll actually be a two-part webinar uh, about uh, coaching. Now, unfortunately, uh, we will not be able to record, so if it's something that interests you, uh, please register, but you will need to be there. Uh, it'll be uh, two fabulous women who will be uh, providing the coaching, so uh, hope you all uh, join us for that. And how's it going, Michelle? Uh, it's going pretty quick. We've actually got uh, 19, 20 in progress out of 53. 
Um, it was given a three minute timer so that you should have plenty of time to get through them. Most of the questions are uh, multiple choice, so they should take only a few seconds. Uh, so again, if you uh, don't see it originally, just drag uh, a panel across. You should see across the top polling. Uh, twist open that panel and then scroll through the list. There are 10 questions, so make sure that you scroll down and scroll down and answer every single one of them. So you're probably wondering why we're going through all this. Uh, we've actually discovered how to do polling. We've been learning about how to use WebEx just like everyone else. And uh, we were hoping to do, do some polling after the fact, but found that it's actually much more efficient to do it right after the session. So uh, we're hoping to find out more about what you like to do and what you wish from the webinars, and uh, this will help us out a great deal. Uh, it's a little bit of practicing what we preach as well as having the voice of the customer. And just a quick reminder, you have less than 30 seconds, folks, so if you can, uh, either click quick or type fast and make sure to hit that submit button. Yeah, because we'd like to share the results with you. So Desmond, that was absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about uh, quality and risk management. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you still hear me, uh, Ruth? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Because yeah, I I thought after you took. Yes, and uh, thanks. Uh, you know, I'd like to extend my uh, gratitude for all the participants for um, you know staying with it. Um, I knew um, in some cases I rushed through um, you know because I wanted to keep it very. Um, very high level and relevant and just try to get at least some idea across and hopefully you were able to um you were able to 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 learn something i've always found that quality i mean it's a, it's a continuous learning mode and that's that's um why i like to to stay in this and please uh, continue to volunteer and give your time to the society um if you need more information you can google my name you can follow the youtube link for those of you who are asking what fmea is um i'm not monetizing there it's just a question of um, during the COVID, I had some downtime and I was just posting some of the presentations that I did so that it could be of use to everyone. So once again, thank you very much for joining me here today. Thanks. And thank you, Ruth and Michelle, for um, doing such a great job in moderating and hosting. Oh, thanks. So um, how are we doing, Michelle? Can, do we have time to uh, uh, present the results? All right, so everything closed at three minutes. Hopefully we didn't lose five or six people who may have still been in, uh, in process to, uh, to submit. Uh, we still have a minute. Pardon? I said we still had a minute. <laughs> and we put it in three, three minutes. No, I, I thought three minutes is sufficient. I, we may have to extend it, learning from our lesson, that to give people a little bit longer to, uh, to do so. Um, but yeah, we were at 42 out of 52 uh, potential responses, and I can... Uh, go with poll results and do a quick share. The only thing that you as a, a, attendees will see will be the calculated results for the uh, satisfaction level. Um, beyond that, you will not see answers in the way of a short answer or text. Uh, so do we want to uh, continue with that, uh, Ruth, and, sh and do a quick share? Yeah, please. Okay. And while I do that, a question was quickly asked, are people getting RUs for this? Will there be recertification units? Absolutely. It's uh, the standard zero, uh, 0.1 per, uh, 0.1 RUs for the webinar. And uh, when you receive your recording, you'll also receive your RUs.
So after sharing the results, you'll be able to scroll down and scroll through. You'll see that items were automatically calculated uh, based on uh, the responses uh, supplied. And uh, again, anything that was typed in in text form, uh, you will only see your own response. Um, we as panelists will be able to download the Excel file, will be able to see all the responses. Perfect. So will you be able to save that, Michelle? Yeah, I will be able to save everything that we are creating okay. and make sure that we yeah, don't. Yeah, I was going to ask you the same. I would like to see the, um, the poll as well. In, you know. Yep, no problem. We are still recording, so if we were almost done, I will then hit stop, and I will then do all the uh, post-event cleanup. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending, and hope to see you at our next uh, regional webinar on uh, July the 28th for uh, coaching. And thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks. Bye now.